Welcome to Talk Pompeii. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Nina Rabin and Dr. N.K. Mina, both researchers from the National In Institutes of Health. Thank you for joining us today. Dr. Mina, can you briefly describe the role of the NIH in healthcare and where you and Dr. Rabin fit with the disorders like Pompe disease? Yes, thank you for inviting us. So National Institutes of Health is a nascent medical research agency. It includes 27 institutes and centers, and it is part of US Department of Health and Human Services. NIH is conducting and supporting basic clinical and translational medical research and is investigating the causes, treatments, and cures for both common and rare diseases. So the work on Pompe disease began at the NIH almost two decades ago. Nina uh, developed a knockout mouse model of Pompe disease, which is well established model and used worldwide for research on Pompe disease. Over the years, the lab established good working relationship with pharmaceutical companies, which were developing drugs for Pompe disease. This has been a very productive collaboration. Nina and colleagues tested myozyme in large study in our model, and it became very clear that enzyme works well in the heart, but not so well in skeletal muscle. The company was not very happy about it, but further clinical trials confirmed the conclusion. Lab was also trying to understand why skeletal muscle does not respond very well to the therapy. And this led to much better understanding of how muscle damage progress in the, in the course of the disease and what are the additional players. And recently we had a chance to test a new experimental drug. We conducted large scale preclinical study testing new recombinant enzyme. We are much happier with this one. We were able to achieve almost complete reversal of pathology in skeletal muscle. This new experimental drug is now in clinical trial and we are very hopeful. Now we are working on collaborative project to test gene therapy approach in our mice model. Thank you. The paper that you co-wrote, Pompe disease, new developments and an old lysosomal storage disorder was interesting. Dr. Rabin, one interesting piece of trivia was that Pompe disease was the first recognized lysosomal disease. Can you give a brief history on those early studies that led researchers to identify Pompe disease as a lysosomal disease? Yes, I'm very happy to give you a brief history of disease. I think it's a very exciting story. So the first description of the disease was published in 1932. It was published by a Dutch pathologist by the name of Pompe, and it was an autopsy of a seven-year-old girl who unfortunately died from what people thought was cardiomyopathy and pneumonia. What she found on a, uh, autopsy was that the every tissue in the body was filled with glycogen. And the shape of the glycogen particle was kind of like vacuolar. So they called it vacuolar glycogen accumulation. That's all he knew. He didn't know the cause of the disease. He didn't know that it was where glycogen was located inside the cell. I have to say, that exactly at the same time, two other publications were reported. And so life is unfair. These two other authors who described exactly the same case multi in multiple organs, glycogen accumulation, so it was exactly the same case, but the name of the disease became Pompe, but not the names of the other two uh, scientists. So that was for years what was known about the disease. And there were several cases later on described. So then almost 30 years later, a Belgian biochemist 
looked at the cause of this disease. And what he found was that glycogen degradation, the, the, the enzyme which is responsible for glycogen degradation is acid alpha glucosidase, or if he called it acid maltase, it's another name of the enzyme. Um, what he also found was that um, uh, this enzyme, acid maltase or acid alpha glucosidase, was missing in pompa patients. So he established the cause of pompa disease. By coincidence, Dr. Henri Urs, this Belgian scientist, happened to work in the lab with Christian Didu, who a couple of years before, in 1955, discovered the new structure within the cell, lysosome. Lysosome has acidic pH. And when Dr. Hertz recognized that this enzyme works best at the acidic pH, he connected the dots and he claimed that the enzyme is located in the lysosome and that the enzyme is responsible for pompa disease. Now, at that time, several other glycogen storage diseases had already been described and pompa disease was recognized as glycogen storage disease type 2. What Dr. Earth uh, claimed was that the glycogen, which is present not in lysosome, but in the cytosol, functioned perfectly well. It was a big, big, really big breakthrough uh, in the field. So his interpretation was enzyme resides in lysosome, breaks down glycogen, and the other enzymes which present in the cytosol of the cell function perfectly well, and that the, in the case that the cytosolic glycogen metabolizes perfectly well. What was really remarkable, and this is his quote, I have to read it, he said, if the above interpretation is confirmed, it can be expected that other deposition diseases might be explained on the basis of the absence of other lysosomal enzymes. So, pompe disease is the first officially recognized lysosomal storage disease of which there are now more than 50 disorders. And in the future, there obviously will be more than that. So it took almost 30 years from the description of the disease to recognize the cause of the disease. And it took another 30 years to identify the gene. And it took almost 60 years to begin the first therapy for this disorder. That's a brief history of the disease. Wow. Dr. Rabin, in the paper you've noted that there are over 500 mutations reported and that the nature of these defects give rise to the wide range of phenotype. What other factors are there that could contribute to the variability? Okay, this is a very big question. I will try to be as uh, concise as I can. So, for one thing, the different mutations, which result in different level of enzyme activity, obviously would manifest a somewhat different clinical phenotype. And we know that pulp disease in so-called, and I will talk about it a little later, late onset form, is extremely heterogeneous. Suffice it to say that the definition of the late onset disease is the disorder which clinically manifests after 12 months of age and then can go all the way to 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. We had our patients who had their first clinical symptoms in their 50s or 60s. So there is a huge variability. 
So the one factor is the level of residual activity. And this is kind of straightforward. If the level of enzyme activity is higher, the milder the disease. But that's certainly not the end of this story. Some mutations are very common in the population. It is now well known that the most common mutation in adult patients with the disease is so-called IDS mutation. I'm not going into detail about this. It's roughly in 70 to 80 percent of Europeans and Caucasians. Now, so which means that people have the same mutation but still have different clinical manifestations or different clinical phenotypes. What's even mo more important is that this mutation is in vast majority of cases is present in heterozygous states. Just a little bit explanation for heterozygosity. In order to have the disease, you have to have a gene from your father and from your mother. And if this mutation, this common mutation, is only comes from your father or mother, you also have the second defect. Now, in vast majority of patients, adult patients with the disease, this common mutation is present in combination with a very severe mutation, which does not give any enzyme activity. So essentially, the phenotype is determined by this common mutation. Now, and even this patient who seem to be genetically, in terms of the mutation in the gene, are the same, they still have different phenotypes. And then the search of what are the modifying factors. Maybe we can change those modifying factors and then improve the condition for the patient. Began to, people began to investigate. And you have to think about it at three levels. The top level, perhaps not the most important, is the environmental factors, diet and exercise. That could be a factor which makes a difference how the disease is manifested, even though the genetic mutation is a genetic makeup is exactly the same. Now, the second level is, the question is, is there any changes in other genes, not acid alpha glucosidase genes, which affect how the clinical manifestations are. And people were looking very carefully, and it seemed to be a kind of a breakthrough at some point, because it was published that the changes in uh, angio, it's called ACE, angiotensin converting uh, enzyme, and changes which do not cause any disease. These are so-called innocent changes in the gene called polymorphism, uh, that they really associated or linked with more or less severe. One form of this enzyme, one variant of this uh, enzyme, angiotensin converting uh, enzyme, is associated with more severe disease and the other variant is associated with less severe disease. However, very recent data published, I think uh, several months ago, um, say that not so fast. They analyzed a large group of people, I think it was about 130 uh, individuals who were involved in this uh, study, and they actually say that, no, that is probably not true. And they explain the previous data just by this very small number of people who were chosen for uh, this study. So this seems to be, at least for now, out of the picture. However, again, very recently, and this was the publication by a very good uh, lab in Rotterdam, 
what they found, they, what they looked at is not the changes or polymorphism in other genes. They looked at the polymorphism in the acid alpha glucosidase gene. Again, they have a pretty large group of people. I think it was around 130 to 150. And they did a methodically a very detailed analysis of every amino acid in acid alpha glucosidase, uh, in every letter in the gene encoding for acid alpha glucosidase. And, then, and they found one tiny change. Again, this is the change, it's in exon 2 of the gene, and this is called previously called so-called silent mutation. It does not change the amino acid in the protein. Nowadays, it's called synonymous mutation. So you change one letter in the, um, the, in the gene, and it does not change the amino acid. So it's like synonyms in language. So it's called synonymous mutation. And they very clearly show that so there are two variants again of acid alpha glucosidase one with this change the other one without this change and the one with this change was very strongly associated with earlier onset of the disease and with more resistance to enzyme replacement therapy now why this i think my personal opinion is that this is a very important finding. Because nowadays, when newborn screening is available, I don't know if this is available in Canada, but in the US, in many states, and in Europe, newborn screening is available. So the baby is born, and in a couple of days, the parents receive essentially the diagnosis. They receive the information that the baby will develop the disease. If this mutation is consistent with what we call late onset disease, but certainly it's a tremendous anxiety and a problem. So who knows when the disease will show up. So this kind of studies and identification of this modifying element has a tremendous importance because it will help follow up this patient. And if we know that the patient will develop the disease much earlier, we will keep a very careful eye on this patient and perhaps start therapy significantly earlier. That's all I can say for the moment, unless you have any questions. <laughs> Yeah, so does this help to understand the difference in affected siblings and even twins? Yes, yes, because in, in affected siblings, yes, we've seen families in which a brother and sister develop the disease with, let's say, 10 years difference. Obviously, it's more subtle because if you ask patients when they actually, in retrospect, when they think they have the early signs of, they always will look back and say that they develop it much earlier. But still, there is a huge difference, even between the twins. And so for these cases, this polymorphism, this modifying factor may have a significant role. Dr. Rabin, how has our understanding of the differences between infantile and late onset Pompe disease evolved? Okay, so as I mentioned, we have the classical infantile onset. Nobody questions uh, the description of what it is. This is several parameters, less than 1% enzyme activity, first symptoms within the first months or even days after birth. Muscle problem, muscle hypotonia, and severe cardiomyopathy and cardiomegaly. 
and very often, at least before the newborn screening, the diagnosis of the infantile was based on a simple x-ray with hugely enlarged cardiac muscle heart. So this is a well-established form and well-described. Now, with late onset disease, the definition of late onset and the usage of late onset form is a relatively recent development. In the 60s, when the first cases of uh, pompa disease not in infants were described by Dr. Engel at Mayo Clinic, he called it childhood onset and adult onset. And many people now, and in particular, one of the leading specialists in pompa disease, Dr. Arnold, uh, Arnold Reuser from uh, the Netherlands, he feels, and I completely agree with him, that the definition, that the term late onset doesn't make much sense. Because if you define late onset as something which begins if you use the cutoff age, 12 months, and then you say everything from 12 months onwards is late onset, it doesn't make much sense. So I completely agree with him that it's much better to say that there is a classic infantile, and again, nobody questions that part, and then there is a childhood, sometimes it was referred as juvenile, a childhood and adult form is a much better uh, structure of the different forms of, of the disease. Dr. Mina, with the availability of ERT, infantile patient survivability is much better, which is wonderful. But this has led to a brand new group of patients with new set of symptoms. Are we seeing any patterns emerging in this group as they enter adulthood? Yes, there, there, are, uh, there is a new set of new, new group of patients with new set of symptoms. And we also described this in our recent review. So introduction of ERT as treatment is proved most beneficial with uh, IOPD. The effect of ERT on cardiac size and function increased survivability. The survivors, in particular long-term survivors, develop a new phenotype that reflects multi-system involvement. Despite ERT, many long-term survivors have muscle weakness, respiratory dysfunction, hearing loss, ptosis, a, a motor speech disorder, and reduced speech intelligibility. These are all manifestations of new emerging phenotypes. These changes were not seen previously because of early fatality in untreated infantile patients. And also a recent study uh, reported that uh, there is a progressive white matter lesions which affect cognitive and neuropsychological development in ERT treated long-term survivors who reach adulthood. This is a very important finding the recombinant enzyme injected intravenously does not reach the central nervous system because of what is called blood-brain barrier. It means that additional approaches may be needed and raises new questions about how treatment will be shaped in the future. How different are the outlooks for crim positive and crim negative persons? Yes, it's a quite different. So, uh, First of all, what is cream positive and cream negative? So some patients produce dysfunctional enzyme and known as cream positive, whereas cream negative produce no enzyme at all. So cream negative patients develop an immune response to the recombinant enzyme, which becomes much less effective. However, a combination of ERT and immunomodulation is very helpful. Although in general, the outcome in this group is less favorable than in cream positive. It is also very important to start therapy as early as possible within days after birth, and it is now feasible because of the newborn screening. One of the fields that patients are hoping to see progress in is muscle regeneration. Dr. Rabin, 
Have you seen anything encouraging in your lab's research? I haven't seen anything encouraging in our lab research, but I do see encouraging results in some other people's lab. Again, this is in Rotterdam, in at Erasmus University, a very good and well-established lab, and they've been studying pompa disease for years. So they focused on the problem of regeneration. We all know that in general, muscle regenerates very well. If there is a wound, muscle restores itself. The mu muscle regeneration depends on the presence of cells, which are called satellite cells in skeletal muscle. Those are tiny cells which lie under the uh, membrane which covers the uh, muscle cell. So they were very smart people in this lab and they asked several questions. Question number one, if there is any difference in the number of the satellite cells, maybe in pompa patients, for some reason the number is so low that they cannot regenerate. And they looked at muscle biopsy. By the way, I have to say that there is also a lab, uh, a French group who works on muscle regeneration. I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, so they looked at the number of these cells and there is a specific marker for these cells. You can take muscle biopsy, stain it, and literally count what's the number of these cells in normal, healthy individual, and normal individual with pompe disease. And what they found was, and it's a good news, that the number is exactly the same. Nothing is wrong with the amount of satellite cells in uh, skeletal muscle uh, in pompe patients. Now, okay. Then they ask that in, uh, in order to regenerate muscle, these cells which sit very quietly, they don't do anything in muscle cells, but after injury, after muscle injury, they start proliferating, meaning they are multiplying, they start to di differentiate, which means that they elongate fuse with each other and essentially generate new muscles and the new muscle fibers fuse with already existing muscle fibers, thus increasing muscle mass. So the next question they ask is, can these cells in pompa patients respond properly to muscle injury? So they injured muscles, not obviously in humans, but in animal model, in mice. And what they showed, and it was confirmed by these two independent groups, that they respond quite well, exactly the same way as the uh, satellite cells in wild type normal mouse without pompa disease. That was a very good news. Now, the question is why they don't respond. In many other diseases, muscle diseases, for example, Duchenne muscle dystrophy, which is a very common muscle uh, disorder, they do respond, and that there you could clearly see regenerating muscle. In pompous skeletal muscle, there is absolutely no regeneration. So their conclusion and future direction is that there is, it is a lack of signal, and they don't know what this signal is, which would make this cell start proliferating, differentiating, and converting themselves into muscle cells. There are several hypotheses. These are probably uh, beyond the scope of our conversation, and there are some very exciting clues of why there's lack of activation of these cells may be the reason uh, why there is no regeneration. But this is definitely a very promising area of um, 
investigation. Awesome. So it certainly sounds like there's some exciting things that are taking place within the research community Absolutely. right now. Absolutely. Of course, yeah. That's wonderful. One, one problem, there are several problems here. It may well be that there is, that it happens because the, in other muscle disorders in which the regeneration does occur spontaneously or you can somehow stimulate it, in those diseases, the membrane which covers muscle fiber is damaged. So it, you always pay a price for everything. In pulpy disease, the membrane of muscle fibers is not damaged. The, so the signal to activate the satellite cell does not come from that. But if we can find the way to activate that cell, then we will initiate very efficient muscle regeneration. My fingers will stay crossed then. Mine too. Dr. Raven and Dr. Mina, thank you so much for taking the time to join me this evening. Thank you. It was thank our you. pleasure. It has been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you.